Hi, this is Peter from the IDR team. Welcome to this uh, I2K 2022 workshop, Achieving the Fair Vision in Imaging. Have you ever wanted to find existing data to reuse? I wonder what your experience was. Uh, you were probably trying to find something via internet, either on image databases or otherwise. And you might have had the following problems. You might have found something or very hard to find. Uh, it might have been very hard to download, uh, too big for your local storage, or uh, they were lacking metadata. Uh, so you didn't really know what you're looking at. And there was unclarity with respect to licensing. And you didn't know if you can actually reuse the image. Uh, image data resource is a resource which is run by the OME team and uh, is addressing, of course, much more than the problems which I just highlighted in my first slide. Uh, it is a resource run for the scientific community, uh, of, which is kind of a equivalent of gene banks in the imaging world. It's a publicly accessible place. And of course, uh, the suggestion here is that you can uh, reuse the data in it for uh, your, uh, let's say, image analysis. Uh, it contains so-called reference data sets, uh, which are fully annotated. And it publishes data which were uh, uh, connected to uh, publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals. It has a highly curated metadata. And uh, what is very important and will be uh, go get, get gotten in depth during this workshop is that it allows cloud reanalysis of the image data stored in IDR. So what will we do in this workshop? We will explore the images and metadata in the IDR. And uh, this will be done using user interface so that you can simply have an idea of how you can most conveniently find uh, image data for reanalysis in a scientific world. And uh, then uh, we will fetch and reanalyze programmatically uh, images using first the Omero API. Omero is a software which is uh, underneath IDR and uh, it's an image management software. Then we will go beyond IDR, so to say, into a near future. And the NGF stands for Next Generation File Format. And we will explore how to improve the experience of uh, uh, working with remote data. What we will learn in this workshop is first we will uh, orientate and in the IDR and its uh, metadata ecosystem. Then we will programmatically uh, fetch the uh, image planes uh, using the Omero API, as well as programmatically fetching the metadata from the Omero API. And then we will learn how to uh, uh, segment the fetched images in Python environment and compare results uh, with the original results coming from IDR. We will understand what cloud optimized format is, and we will do that on an example of OME NGFF. And then we will run on the OME NGFF and analysis parallel threads using the Python library Dask. So that's what you are hopefully looking for now. Uh, we will have um, some materials to use and link to the walkthrough PDF is on the downloads of microscopy.org under the logically named folder, pardon me. And this is, or this link is also to be found under the, this video in the description. So let's go into IDR now. I will show you the connection between the publications and IDR. I am in the um, 
search engine of the PubMed, and I'm looking for a publication about which I know that its data are stored in IDR. First author is Blin, and I know that it deals with segmentation. And I'm finding it uh, right here. It introduces a tool called Nessis, uh, basically a tool for automated detection of nuclei uh, within some models, among which are uh, mouse blastocysts. Uh, it is coming from Sally Lovell's lab in the University of Edinburgh. I need the full text of this paper, which is freely available in PLOS Biology. I will start searching inside the paper for data availability section. Uh, this is found in this paragraph in Indeed, uh, claims that the data has been deposited uh, to the image data resource, IDR, and under accession number 62, I will click on the IDR link and I'm landing in the homepage of IDR, idr.microscopy.org. And because I remember the number 62, I can type it here in the uh, search and accept the default suggestion. But first of all, let me tell you, this is not the only way how you can approach uh, your searches from here. You can study the newly uh, released thumbnails and uh, click on the studies and go into them directly or use the drop down menu uh, here to uh, search for other attributes than the IDR accession number as well as uh, if you scroll a little bit lower there are videos in so-called exploring idr series where you can learn about uh, user interface workflows such as i am doing right here now so i will search for 62 as highlighted and this will find me one thumbnail i will click on it and i am renavigated into the idr itself if you want uh, this is based on omero Omero being the image management software underlying IDR, uh, we call this interface Omero Web. The study uh, connected to the paper Blin et al. I just found on PubMed is selected and I can read some metadata about it on the right hand pane. I will go through this exploration quite quickly. I selected a subcontainer called Blastocysts, which contains uh, images. I will select uh, one of those images in the center pane and zoom in the center pane. And uh, I can very importantly see the most important metadata of that image. Each image in IDR is annotated with this level of uh, uh, precision. And uh, I can, for example, see the organism, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as well as in the attachments I have um, an uh, TIFF image containing uh, labels which represent segmentations run by the authors on this image. Uh, the authors segmented the image and submitted the labels in the form of TIFF, a separate image, uh, together with these uh, images of mouse blastocysts. These uh, segmentation labels were turned into uh, regions of interest in um, IDR during the curation process and I can see them if I double click on the thumbnail of this image like so and the full viewer of uh, this image opens in a new tab you can open any image in IDR in a full viewer we call it Omero Eye Viewer and uh, you can scroll through Z like I'm doing right now if you have a Z stack or you can scroll through time if you have a time lapse on your hand, which is not the case in, in this mouse blastocyst image. Um, furthermore, you can change the rendering settings the way uh, the image is displayed on the screen, uh, such as, for example, you might not be used to see DAPI as yellow uh, uh, and the laminin as uh, blue. I will swap the colors like so. And um, I can also manipulate the highest displayed intensity using the sliders here. As I cannot save anything into IDR, which makes openly sense, uh, because this is a public access, publicly accessible uh, resource, uh, I can uh, simply refresh the page and I will go back to the state which is, which is saved there. 
And let me also do one thing. Let's let me switch off the yellow dappy channel. Uh, because what I wanted to show you in the first place was uh, where the regions of interest, which are the labels uh, coming ultimately from the authors which submitted the uh, above mentioned uh, TIFF images. The labels are now displayed uh, as an overlay over the image of the mouse blastocyst. You can see that they are uh, also in uh, all Z planes and I can select them either in the image or in the table uh, on the right hand side like so and we will work with this very image in a second uh, as well as with these accompanying labels which we will fetch programmatically using Omero API in the further course of this workshop. So this is the second part of our workshop uh, analysis using Omero API. Um, Omero is the software underlying IDR. It's an image management software and we will use its application programming interface to programmatically uh, fetch images and segmentation labels from IDR into a pre-built environment. Uh, it can be local or on the cloud. Our recipe can be built either locally or on the cloud. Um, this recipe we will provide to you and I will explain to you in a second how to build this environment. It's a Python based environment with a package called uh, Stardist. Uh, the authors of the original paper uh, whose data are stored in IDR and who did uh, this first segmentation and submitted the labels to IDR did not consider Stardist at all. Uh, this is our own uh, addition and it demonstrates how you can use IDR and this very environment we will go through in a minute to uh, reanalyze images inside IDR and let's say calibrate a tool such as Stardist or any other tool or um, Stardist model or uh, use simply the, the data from IDR as a ground truth in any other way. So how to build this uh, Python environment? Well, first of all, you can simply go to Omero Guide Python on this URL. The URL is also underneath this video and uh, click on the badge. This will immediately spin up the environment for you and you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, the details are in the readme of this very Omero guide Python. If you are a little bit uh, command line shy, uh, you might be happy with the uh, cloud uh, built environment and ignore what I'm showing right now. And this is how to build the environment locally on your computer. For that, you will need to execute a couple of commands on the command line. Uh, first of all, we offer a uh, repo to Docker uh, way. Uh, repo to Docker is a Python package which uh, builds for you uh, a content of a repository such as Omero Guide Python uh, into a, a Docker container. Docker container you can uh, imagine as a kind of a virtual machine running on your computer. You will have to install Docker if you want to go this way. And then uh, you will have to install a repo to Docker, uh, clone the repository, uh, CD into it, and run repo to Docker space dot. Again, details in the readme of the Omero Guide Python where you can uh, copy those commands from. Second local way to uh, build the analysis environment is the Conda way. Uh, it's, uh, it needs a couple of more commands to, uh, to install, not too much. But again, you might be familiar with Conda and I would not wonder that you would go in that case for this way. Again, you have to clone the repository CD into it and then create a conda environment with this command. Environment YAML is the recipe file 
which is used in all of those cases, but in this case, it's kind of um, visible. It's in the binder folder of the Omero Guide Python repo. And then you create the newly created environment. Uh, and this step is already optional. You might or might not install Jupyter. I will show you uh, the folder called scripts, which are also in Omero Guide Python, which you can use instead of Jupyter. Jupyter. Uh, this command uh, is um, dependent on what way you use uh, to uh, what conda you have installed, um, anaconda, miniconda, and uh, it all can be uh, found out in detail in Omero Guide Python, such as uh, when do you need to run uh, the last command or not. So when you have built your environment, um, you will be presented inside Jupyter uh, with a, a view like uh, I have now on the screen where the scripts are under the folder scripts. You can see all the Jupyter notebooks basically can be run as scripts, uh, meaning on the side to the Jupyter notebooks, we also offer scripts so that you can run all the workflows inside Jupyter notebooks without needing to run Jupyter itself. That's what I meant. And the no Jupyter notebooks, which are um, here for didactic purposes, and we will use them in this workshop uh, on the uh, folder called notebooks. And we will now use the IDR0062 prediction, IPYNB. So first of all, you have to uh, verify that on the top right, you have a kernel called Stardist. Uh, if not, then you have to go to kernel, change kernel, and Stardist. Uh, kernel is the runtime environment which basically executes the commands you give inside the Jupyter notebook. And uh, you just build, let's say, on the Conda environment, a uh, this Stardist environment, you will have to uh, you will have to add it as a kernel into Jupyter notebook. Uh, or it will be added there automatically for you. Uh, you will, in any case, have to quickly check that this says Stardist. It really depends on which way of building this environment you chose. So this notebook, as indicated on my slide, uh, loads image with labels from IDR and uses Stardist. So the Stardist is the Python uh, package and we, we will uh, segment the image from IDR, so to say second time. First time it was segmented by the authors who did not use Stardist. This cell does not have to be run uh, if you are not using uh, Google Colab. So I will skip it because I'm using the Conda way and I will import some packages. NumPy is a important Python package for scientific computing, and it contains and gives you a tool of NumPy array, which is uh, an array uh, capable of uh, uh, storing binary image data, such as we will use here in a second. We will connect to IDR. We will teach the notebook which image ID we want to analyze and just uh, get a handle from Omero uh, of that image, not that image itself, not the binary data themselves. Then comes a helper method to load the binary data, uh, which uh, basically reorders the dimensions of the uh, multidimensional stack, which the image is. So uh, 5D image stands here for uh, the three normal dimensions, uh, spatial dimensions, and then time and channels. And we will need this stack to be ordered in the order T, C, Z, Y, X, and this method is doing just that. Um, so it's fetch is loading the NumPy array and reordering the planes as we need them. The loading itself is happening in the cell below. This will take a short while. In the heat of the battle, I forgot to execute the definition of the of the method, which was of course a mistake. And now the loading is in progress. 
So the binary data of the image has just been loaded. Uh, it is a single time point, two channels and 257 Z planes. Now we will load the labels, meaning the segmentation um, results from uh, the IDR from the authors of the paper. Uh, we will just load them and put them on the ice. We don't need them uh, for our own segmentation. Uh, we will come back to that later. So I executed uh, those two cells, which are basically using the Omero API to fetch the labels. And uh, the labels have uh, are also uh, in three dimensions. And of course, the dimensions correspond to the dimensions of the image. Now we will load the Stardust train model. Uh, this is the default Stardust model. Uh, we don't have any ambition to be perfect in our segmentation. This is done. In the next cell, uh, the uh, Stardust model is applied on the segmentation of our image. And uh, in this cell, we will basically iterate through the planes of the image. And in each plane, we will uh, perform the segmentation. Stardust will do it better said for us. Uh, we will use channel one for that uh, segmentation of the image. Um, and uh, we will create two outputs. First, we will create polygons uh, as a result of the segmentation, so polygon shapes. And we will also uh, create uh, new labels. Um, the labels are in the uh, variable called results. Uh, you can see that this is an array of uh, which uh, consists of the new uh, new labels and uh, we will put it into a numpy array called label slices okay so these are our new labels from a stardust uh, secondly we created an another array called shapes and uh, these are the polygons so we basically in one uh, for loop created two kinds of output okay um, in order to be able to see what we did is we can we can print the first part of the arrays. So I said the results can be printed in its entirety. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Pardon me, again, I forgot to uh, execute the previous cells and that's why my printing of results did not work, but it does work in this case. And you can see that the results are uh, basically uh, not very human readable, but these are these are the labels uh, coming up from out of our segmentations. Okay, and we can create a new cell in, a new cell in, uh the notebook like so and put in print shapes and execute that cell and you can see that the shapes are um, basically describing the polygons uh in a much more human readable way we will then uh, save these uh, shapes as GeoJSON just to show you a way how to uh, basically be more interoperable with your regions of interest with the results coming out of this notebook. And uh, we will write the GeoJSON, which you might know uh, is a human and machine readable format. And then we can see the GeoJSON in our notebook after we executed this cell if we go to here and have a look. So basically each paragraph inside the GeoJSON is corresponding to one segmented uh, polygon shape. Where is my notebook? Uh, I 
now we come to uh, the labels which we were holding, so to say, on ice. Uh, as I said, they are stored in the variable uh, called labels, and we will we will put those labels which are coming from the authors of the paper side by side with our newly created labels. These are the ones which I printed out right here. And uh, they are stored in the variable called label slices. And it, this will appear in this matplotlib uh, routine on the right hand side. So I, I have indicated that these are Z stacks and I can slide through Z. On the left are the segmentations from the authors. On the right are our new segmentation coming from Stardist, which we created a second ago. And you can see that the correspondence is not too bad. Uh, you can use this notebook as a template and replace even Stardist with uh, some package of yours or calibrate other um, models inside Stardist. Or, or simply use the um, notebook in any other way, uh, which will uh, help you to use the data coming from IDR as a ground truth uh, against any uh, uh, further reanalysis you might choose to do on it. Okay, we close the connection to the IDR and then we have some exercises prepared for you here. I will not go through them inside the video. Uh, here you can practice uh, writing and reading, reading the GeoJSON, uh, reading the GeoJSON and then displaying single planes uh, similarly to the cell, which is uh, highlighted right here. And the second exercise, is basically uh, trying to uh, clarify a following point. IDR is a Nomero server, and uh, um, we can uh, use also other Omero servers uh, to, uh, for this notebook to connect to. Uh, IDR is a very special Omero server. It has a lot of data, but you cannot write any data back to it. Uh, if you have any other Omero server, where you can write the data back to, uh, you can go through the exercise two and uh, learn how to use this notebook against such Omero server. It's easy to find the solutions by clicking here. The new notebook is not executable. So if I click on the solutions, you can simply click off the uh, warning and uh, copy and paste the cells into the previous notebook. And this will give you the solutions of the exercises. Uh, this concludes the second part of uh, the, this uh, I2K workshop. Thank you. Uh, hi. In the third part of this workshop, uh, let me introduce you to a format which is optimized for remote access. What do I mean? In the previous analysis steps, we were using so-called proprietary file format, which is not uh, optimized for remote access, so-called not cloud optimized. Um, let me tell you first what OME NGFF is. OME NGFF is a file format for modern data access. And uh, we have published a paper, uh, meaning the OME team published a paper on OME NGFF. Um, it is a open specification, which is uh, not a finished product. And uh, you can contribute to the specification. First step would be to go to this GitHub repository and read the instructions. So uh, the specification is um, worked on in tight cooperation with the community. OME NGFF is based on ZAR. Um, so, um, uh, it uh, has it is heavily informed and uh, connected also to TIFF and HDF5. It can store the same uh, metadata as TIFF or HDF5. 
uh, it can also store uh, segmented masks representations, such as you might remember from the beginning of this video, uh, we had these uh, masks submitted uh, with the blastocyst image, uh, which were representing the segmentation as separate files. Uh, ZAR uh, stores these masks in uh, the same structure. Um, so what is ZAR actually? ZAR is a young format for the storage of chunked, compressed, and dimensional arrays. Uh, it permits um, storing of uh, individual chunks uh, on, as files on a file system or on an object store. So one chunk corresponds to one file on, on let's say, file system. And uh, this chunk is accessible uh, by calling it by, by name, and uh, it can be fetched independently of the other chunks uh, of uh, the same image. The image is represented by the whole grid, and the uh, chunks are, of course, the yellow parts here. Uh, the part which is being fetched might be even the whole Z plane of an image. It really depends on how the chunking is done on the particular image. Um, we will, in this workshop, not uh, store our um, ZAR images or the OME and GFF images on a file system. Instead, we will use the remote cloud storage uh, I'll call S3 bucket. It's not the purpose of this workshop to go into the details of S, what S3 is. It is a whole different storage system uh, um, from the from the file system you might be used to. And if you want to know more, please refer to the link here. Uh, we will further use a Python library called Dask, which natively scales Python and allows a parallel computing, computing on parallel threads. Um, going to our pre-built notebooks environment, uh, let me first uh, show you more in depth uh, how the chunking is uh, laid out, uh, or as an example of chunks laid out layout. Uh, this is done by starting the ZAR public S3 multiscale notebook. Uh, we will explore in this notebook a we will explore in this notebook a um, electron micrograph of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, which was um, which is stored in IDR and uh, was published originally in 2020 in Science by uh, a group from uh, Netherlands, Utrecht. And uh, this is a very large image. Uh, we have uh, taken this image deposited by authors in the IDR and transformed it into OME and GFF and stored it in a separate S3 storage. It is publicly accessible. And uh, we will take this converted uh, image from S3 storage and uh, explore it in this notebook. It is uh, a very, very large image. And so it has um, multi resolutions. Um, The original image is over 25 gigabytes uh, big, but with the help of uh, Dask, which I mentioned on my slide, this Python library, uh, we can lazily load just uh, portions of the, or just some re required regions of the image. Uh, the image is stored as uh, 5D uh, arrays. The images are stored as 5D arrays. Uh, I mean, the um, spatial dimensions, time, and uh, channels, as you already know, and the orders T, C, Z, Y, X is important. Uh, and this is how the um, uh, order of the array dimensions is, are laid out in ZAR. Um, the downsampled versions, uh, which I already mentioned, uh, have been stored 
together with the image. Uh, this is a principle you might know from uh, Google Maps, uh, uh, where uh, you uh, As you are zooming into a particular street uh, on Google Maps, the underlying image is changing, showing more details as you go in. Um, so you are starting from the more downsampled version uh, and um, uh, zooming into a more detailed one, to so more detailed maps. And uh, this is the this is the principle of the multi resolutions mentioned here. Uh, but of course, the image is also chunked as it is uh, OME ZAR, as it is uh, OME NGFF. And uh, the list of resolution is uh, stored in a text file called Z attributes, ZATERS. And uh, we can easily, using Dask, create a nice summary uh, in Jupyter. Uh, the resolutions are stored from the largest, uh, the most detailed to the smallest. And the next cell is going to show us a nice overview. So I'll run it. And you can see uh, when we read the, basically the metadata Z attributes file, uh, it says that the um, uh, largest resolution has more than uh, 1,212 thousand chunks and that's a graphic representation of it and then when we go to the uh, lower and lower le resolutions uh, the number of chunks is diminishing this has this one has 216 uh, over 54 and then the last resolutions com uh, resolution is uh, the lowest resolution is comprised of only one chunk a couple of them uh, of the lowest resolution and uh, with the next cell, we will uh, fetch the uh, lowest resolution only. Uh, we know already that this is just one chunk. And we can see that it's quite pixelated when I executed the cell. We can then fetch the third lowest resolution. This is uh, already much smoother image, of course, uh, of, the same, of the same features as we hopefully understand. And then we will do a programmatically a programmatical zoom in. This means that we will be fetching uh, um, the same amount of uh, pixels from the same uh, central spot and uh, displaying the images under each other, which will, uh, but always the next image will be from a higher resolution uh, than the previous one, uh, which will make a uh, make you uh, feel just like if you are zooming in. So if we execute this cell, you can see that the images are being fetched and you are zooming into because you are viewing higher and higher resolutions from the same plane. And this is all done programmatically using the Dask uh, library and the chunked uh, and OME and GFF. Next, we will open the IDR0044 SAR segmentation parallel uh, notebook. Uh, we will work in this notebook with a light sheet image, which was published by McDowell Lab in 2018 in Cell. Uh, we can see this image in the IDR. I will show it just now. Uh, that's a light sheet image of an in total mouse embryo. And uh, you can see it's a time lapse uh, as well as a Z stack. Uh, the image uh, has been converted from the IDR, from the image deposited in the IDR, you just saw a second ago into OME NGFF. And this OME NGFF was stored in a public S3 store, S3 store, just like in the case of the previous notebook. Nevertheless, in this notebook, uh, we will uh, also do some analysis in parallel threads on uh, this uh, very large um, light sheet image. Uh, unlike in the previous notebook of the 
uh, electron microscopy image where which was just where the um, parts of the image was just fetched and displayed. Um, so let us start with the importing of the Dask library, which you are getting hopefully familiar with. And then now we have a helper method, uh, which will load the Dask array. Uh, it's not loading the image itself. Uh, that will be done later in the notebook. The, the, the image dimensions are nevertheless already apparent from the output of the uh, of the dask array. And it is saying that uh, we have more than 1,000 uh, Z-planes, more than 500 time points and two channels. Um, so the particular planes are not uh, too big, but there are many of them. Um, in this notebook, we will be working with whole planes, but it will be a tiny subset of the whole image, obviously, because we will fetch just uh, just 100 planes. Uh, to segment the image, we prepare a method uh, which uh, you can uh, replace with your own if you wish so. Um, we will simply use uh, um, the ND filter sub package of the task image package um, as it is the simplest. Then we will use task delayed. Task delayed um, will record what we want to compute first and store it into a graph, which will then um, be run later. Um, let's say on parallel hardware, but also if I have just one computer, if I have multiple cores, uh, the task is clever enough to make uh, use of that and run analysis parallel threads, which will thus be more effective and faster. Um, we will uh, analyze only 100 planes, and these 100 planes will be basically the um, uh, five uh, Z planes to each side of a center of an image and five time points to each side of a center of the image, making 10 by 10, uh, making 100 planes. Uh, this is uh, highlighted in the looping here. And this method is basically creating uh, the graph using dask delay. Dask delay is being uh, applied on our analyze function. This is this, is, uh, this line here. And the graph is stored in this, uh, lazy result list. And we will print out the lazy result list, which will obviously have 100, uh, pardon me, uh, which will obviously have 100 uh, uh, items in it. And uh, this lazy result list uh, is basically telling the task delayed uh, the information about the uh, uh, T, Z, and C uh, uh, for each image, uh, which have to be passed to the analyze function, which we just uh, def defined and discussed and wrapped into the task delay. Uh, and the analysis have not been run yet. And now Dask is using a scheduler. And in the moment when we use this compute method, the scheduler will simply schedule the tasks uh, in the most effective manner onto our capacities so on whatever machines cluster or whatever we are using. So let's start the uh, computation itself. This is finished. Uh, here we have a helpful output of how long it took. And now we will display the results of the segmentation using the Python library here. We have a slider which which goes through the plane. You have to read the Z and T uh, indices here. Pardon me. And we can compare the image with the image with the original image in the IDR. Indeed, you can recognize or on this thumbnail even better that the segmentation, uh, simple as it was, was relatively successful. Uh, 
And hopefully this shows you uh, the usage of task delayed uh, for computing in parallel threads. And this also concludes our workshop. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed that and thank you very much for watching. Bye.